Coming up next on this special edition of Arizona Horizon, we'll take a look at plans to build a massive solar tower in the western Arizona desert. We'll hear from the people responsible for the state's first net zero energy school and find out about EFAZ, a group that's working to improve Arizona's environment through workplace giving. It's all part of tonight's Focus on Sustainability, next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the special edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. In our continuing focus on sustainability, we take a look at a huge solar tower that an Australian company is planning to build in the Arizona desert. The concept was featured on a Discovery Channel program about innovative technologies. Roger Davey will build a solar plant on the scale never seen before. It is spectacular. The top of the tower will be right at about our eyesight as we're, we're situated right now. About 65 metres across, or what's that, about 190 feet in diameter. He calls it the Solar Power Tower. It will be the world's biggest solar power plant and one of the tallest objects ever built. It will rise 400 feet taller than Taipei 101, the world's tallest building. Around the base, a sheet of glass six times the size of New York's Central Park. It's a vast area, even from up here, isn't it? And the tower in the center, 600 meters tall. It really is a sight. Unlike traditional solar plants, Rogers Tower is powered by the same principle that keeps this balloon aloft. Rising hot air. The sun's rays beat down on the glass and heat the air trapped underneath. Hot air rises, so the air runs towards the center where the tower is situated. And just like a cold day when you light a fire, the smoke goes whoosh up the chimney, runs through turbines, and turbines spin through the generators generating electricity. Which I think is almost the holy grail of renewable energy. Joining me now to talk about his company's efforts to build a solar tower in western Arizona's La Paz County is Chris Davey, the executive director of EnviroMission. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Nice to be here. Now, what we saw there, a lot of animation there, a lot of plans, a lot of ideas going on. Um, and we kind of saw how this works. Give me a better indication. This sounds fascinating. What exactly, how exactly are we going to get power out of that big old silo out there? Okay, just quickly. Um, we put a large sheet of plastic out there, and when solar energy hits that plastic, it heats the air beneath it, as it would in a hot house for flowers or any or a greenhouse. The hot air flows in towards the center where the tall tower is located. And that differential in temperature, being hot at the bottom, cold at the top, causes the hot air to be drawn out. And that's, just, what, we're, that's what we're seeing right now. There, there's, there's a, the ground heating goes up the silo. Yeah, just like if you lit a fire in a fireplace, uh, the hot air rises. We channel the air through turbines, which in turn turns a generator and creates electricity. 200 megawatts, it says there. 200 megawatts of electricity, which uh, to the layperson means in excess of 150,000 households. Okay. So it's a lot of power that's going to be generated. Uh, that's a lot of height we're looking at here, too. And that, that mm -hmm. is a tall tower compared to some other pretty tall things around the world yeah. here. Uh, is this viable? Very, very. The Dubai Tower has just been built. It's in excess of 2,800 feet. This is planned to be shorter than that now. And given the height to width ratio, meaning the diameter of that tower versus the height, it's extremely stable. We're talking about seven to eight times, whereas a skyscraper is 12 to 14 times as tall as it is wide. So 120, 120,000, was that, was that what it was again? In excess of 100. In, okay, um, how is that power delivered? Those large transmission lines that you see crossing the country, uh, we essentially plug into those, and once it's there, it can feed the market. Is, it can get to the utility. Are there lines where you are planning to build there in La Paz County close yes. enough? Yes, there are. There are lines that actually run adjacent to the property with a substation, which is where you actually plug the power in, just north. 
compare the power cost of this to current methods, current models. Okay. Uh, if you were to turn around and build a new coal facility or a new nuclear facility today, not one that's already been paid for 10 times over, uh, we're cheaper than nuclear and cheaper than coal to actually generate the power. Uh, if you were to build a natural gas facility, that's the only thing right now that, you know, given gas prices being at all-time lows, that would be cheaper. So how much cost to build something, just to build something like that, as far mm -hmm. forget the power cost, let's talk about construction, uh, how much land mm -hmm. is needed, and again, are these things viable? Yeah, well, capital cost of the project, ballpark, around $700 million. Uh, we have a financial commitment, 100% commitment for those dollars right now. Uh, in terms of land use, you know, it's around about three to three and a half thousand acres, uh, which if you were to compare that to other solar resources, it's about the same for the power you generate. That three to three and a half thousand acres, is that for one of these facilities? Because it sounds to me like if you're getting 120,000 out of this, you may want to build a cluster of these things. We, we would ideally love to build multiple facilities in the same region. Uh, so each facility is 200 megawatts. We would plan to build multiple towers in the same region so economies of scale and it will drive the prices down even further. Uh, it looks like there's something of a reflective material down there at the base. Uh, is there a concern regarding that with, with aviation and, and other, other aspects? You've got to love animations. Um, because we're trying to absorb all the energy, yes. it will actually look relatively matte from the air. It won't reflect because you're looking to absorb as much energy as possible, unlike a mirror, for instance, which would be looking to reflect. Uh, from the air, it will not act as a mirror. It will not look as reflective as it does in that video. Are there other aviation concerns? I, I thought that there might have been concerns from the military over in California regarding something along those lines. What, what, what was that all about? Uh, I believe that was a reflective uh, That was project. a reflective thing? Yes, yeah, so completely different to what we're talking about. We have actually filed with the FAA uh, as it relates to this project in Western Arizona and have, <clears throat> have been in constant dialogue with the military as well. Water concerns, Western Arizona, not a lot of water out there. What does this need? How is it going to get that water? We don't use any water at all in power production. So in terms of building this in the West, yes, it makes a hell of a lot more sense than a lot of other technologies. When you take into consideration 40% of the United States fresh water gets used in power production. We're in the West, we live in the desert, and this is going to use none. There is some maintenance going on out there, though. There, was, there will be some human beings out there keeping an eye on stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, look, we're going to employ during construction uh, in the range of about 1,500 workers. Uh, it's peaking at 1,500, drop afterward. Uh, on an ongoing basis, there's probably going to be about 40 to 50 people out there uh, maintaining the facility, security, scheduling, operations, maintenance. Uh, and speaking of maintenance, what kind of longevity for something like this? In excess of 75 years. 75 years. So if you were to compare this to traditional power, you asked me about the costs earlier. This has a life that's in excess double that of a traditional power plant and two to three times that of renewable power plants. And we did talk about the land out there and how much is needed and where it, uh, this particular project would be. Trust land is involved mm -hmm. in this as well. Talk to mm -hmm. us about that. Yeah, we, we've actually got a couple of lease applications in with Arizona State Land Trust. Um, and uh, we're just moving through the final logistics as it relates to that and uh, plan to have site control in the coming months. So there is a, there is a, a plan afoot to work and get the state some money out of this as well. They will be the biggest beneficiary of this project. Um, the lease that's being negotiated will see them revenue share in the project. What kind of timetable are we looking at here for something? Uh, looking to break ground uh, toward the end of next year, beginning of the year after, be online two years after that. And what do we look for? What will be the biggest holdup if it doesn't happen or if it gets delayed? Uh, given we already have capital to build the project, uh, it's the permitting phase. Yeah. It's just making sure that we can move through the various permits within the state in a streamlined process. Well, it's interesting stuff. It's good to have you here. Thanks for explaining it for us, and good luck with your Pleasure. project. Thank you. The state's first net zero energy school, the Colonel Smith Middle School, is located at Fort Huachuca in southern Arizona. To learn more, we spoke with Dr. Rhonda Fruoff, superintendent of the Fort Huachuca School District, and Tony Wall, president of 3W Management, the company that supervised the school's construction.
net zero energy building. What are we talking about here? It's a building that's designed to create uh, as much energy as it utilizes to function and operate. So what about, uh, is it, is it, does it really zero out or can you have a little more and maybe sell it back to the grid? Mr. Wall can answer that directly Okay, for Mr. You. Wall, can you answer that for it's us? It's designed to zero out. We prefer not to sell it back to the grid. But the idea of producing as much as you use is the concept of net zero. And how would you produce that energy? We produce that through solar and through uh, wind turbines that produce energy in our school. And this, are these, these so, solar obviously can be focused, the wind turbines focused as well just on that school or regionally? No, just on our school. Oh. They're small, they're primarily for demonstration and for student purposes. They'll create one to three percent of the energy uh, production for our school usage but they're there for students to see and, and understand how they operate. Indeed, and we're looking at one right now as they're uh, there on the landscape, beautiful uh, structures there. Why Fort Huachuca? Why this school? We um, are in, we're in the process of replacing three of the schools that were on the post that were 40 to 50 years old. I replaced two of them already. They're one's a primary building, one's an element, uh, intermediate elementary building. So when it came time to build the uh, middle school, we wanted to look at sustainability and a, and a building that was projects-based and STEM-focused. So it's designed with all of those pieces in mind. And the kids at the school, as it was referred to earlier, they learn about energy systems literally out the window or actually underneath the system too, because they're outdoors as well, aren't they? Exactly. Um, we, we put in a number of features into the school that would allow the, the students to be able to engage about energy conservation. One of those is an energy dashboard that will measure 37 energy sources and the students can monitor all the electricity being utilized. It can measure the wind and how it's impacting our electrical uh, grid. And it will also measure um, uh, the water harvesting because we have two water harvesting tanks that we use for our irrigation. How does, I mean, when you're designing something like that, when you're thinking something like this through, where do these ideas come from? Talk to us about the, the goals and the whole design aspect. Well, the vision for this school came from Rhonda's research and instruction and her 30 years of experience as an educator. We designed this building to that vision and our team, which was, was very broad, very experienced, very multidisciplinary, um, understood that we had the opportunity to create something special that encompassed so many different things. And, and a number of schools across the country have an element of what we've, we have, but we've taken all of those elements and brought it together to create this wonderful school. What kind of challenges did you face early on and through the process? Um, harnessing our expertise of our big team. Interesting. Um, and uh, that drove us to really use the instructional program and the, and the instructional vision as the uh, as a key for implementation. It sounds like you kind of had some ideas there and you threw those ideas out and they caught them. Where did your ideas come from? What, what set you off on this? Um, well, one of the things that I've learned after 34 years in this business is that in order to engage students, you have to have an environment that is inviting and engaging and one that asks them to um, become architects of their own learning. So when I was given an opportunity to, to do this in this particular setting, mm -hmm. I was able to, to write a concept paper that my governing board actually reviewed and understood and supported. And then we were able to begin to talk about what kind of space, what kind of furniture, what kind of tools, instructional tools that mm -hmm. are appropriate for this type of environment. And with that, once I got a room full of people who built schools and had designed schools and had done parts and pieces, they were able to put this together into one special place. So you said, instead of classrooms, I want collaborative areas, I want indoor, outdoor learning areas. These are the kinds of ideas you had. I want in everything to be a learning environment from the moment they get off the school bus till the day they, till the time they walk out of the building. And if, if th those are among the goals, uh, how does that get done? I mean, what, what, again, what's the process? We change the vocabulary. It's not a classroom, it's a flexible learning space. Flexible learning spaces are adjacent to collaboration areas. It gives teachers the opportunity to put students in groups and, and to uh, move them throughout the day. There's not a rigid place for students to be. This is the Apple store with teachers. This is uh, an environment that's different than most schools have. 
and it's much more engaging for children. It's engaging for children, and also if you're constructing the building, you've got to make sure what it, it's focused in the right direction. Is it east-west as opposed to north-south, or those kinds of what were those things put into play? They absolutely were. Daylighting is a key part of our net zero aspects, and um, in most days, classroom lights are not on. We have enough natural lights coming into lighting coming into the building that we don't need to have classroom lights on. That's a tremendous energy savings. That's a cost savings and a bottom line for the school district and an operating budget that has dollars that get pushed back to the classroom. What kind of response are you getting from, from parents, from teachers, from students? The students were engaged in the design process and they were on our design team. And then they actually uh, were in dialogue groups as we moved through the planning process so that they could say, I like the idea, I don't like the idea. And one of the things that, of course, uh, interested them is that they do have an iPad as part of their instructional program and they utilize that and can use that in their instructional program just as they would any other instructional tool. So they were excited about that and then they were excited about the fact that their furniture in the rooms and classrooms was all mobile and flexible and movable. They could set up areas and there's lots of soft furniture. It has a higher education air about it so they feel a lot more independent and a lot more engaged about being responsible for their educational program. Well, it, look, it looks amazing, but how viable is this for other schools in other districts, the cost, the viability of getting this done? This school's not uh, tremendously expensive in comparison to others across the country. Uh, we've had visitors that come in and, and believe our cost per square foot is, is uh, very, very solid in that respect. We have worked to spend our money wisely we work to make this an educational program that meets our, our Fort Huachuca community. We think it's a program that is able to be repeated in other districts depending on their specific circumstances. And repeated with other buildings, I would imagine, libraries Absolutely. and businesses and these sorts of things. But net zero, I would imagine just making it net zero has to increase the cost a little bit. It does. It, yes. does. it does. Is it the kind of thing that you think most school districts could handle? They can um, because we're able to use power purchase agreements in order to offset some of the costs of the photovoltaic units. Explain a power purchase um, agreement. It's a, it's a partnership uh, with a company that uh, finances your, your uh, panels. Then that money goes back as uh, a part of the electrical grid. And so there's an exchange of those dollars. So we are allowed to put those on our building and they will generate the energy. And then our operations costs, when you start taking energy costs out of your budget, mm -hmm. you can offset some of the cost of your facility in order to be able to do that as well. So there's a return here, uh, but it does take um, everyone on the team talking about how do we design a more efficient building and how do we make this building uh, a building that is a learning facility. And if more are going to be built, costs generally up, down, stable? Costs are stable right now. Right now. Material costs are rising. Yeah. Labor costs are fairly stable. Um, in the future, it'll probably continue to rise with the economy. Interesting. Um, the last question again, because I know I wanted to get the reaction again of, of parents and students and teachers. Oh. The teachers and the parents especially, this is very new. I mean, collaborative yes. this and mm -hmm. open air that. That's, mm -hmm. that's not the same as you know, chalkboard and take your seats kind of thing. How are they responding? Well, one of the things that helped us is our, is our context. We are on Fort Huachuca, which is an Army base that um, focuses on technology and engineering and communications and uh, is staffed by a lot of contractors who have a field of study in science. So they support the focus. And they support the educational environment. So it's for a group of students who really are going to be engaged and move around this country and it is about the parents getting a really good educational opportunity for their children. Well, it sounds fascinating. It's good to have you both here to explain it Thank for you. us. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you. The Environmental Fund for Arizona is a group that helps employers help the environment through workplace giving. But EFAZ does much more than that. I spoke with Executive Director Lane Seaton to find out what the Environmental Fund of Arizona is all about. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. Um, is that a good enough definition there? What, what, what does EFAZ really do? EFAZ, um, first of all, we're a statewide alliance of all environmental and conservation organizations. We have 28 across the state, from Flagstaff down to Tucson. 
And we formed about 11 years ago to really provide a green choice to workplace giving across Arizona. Um, we sort of work similarly to the United Way that provides an opportunity for employees to give to charitable organizations, um, usually during the fall. Um, but at that time, Arizona didn't have different kind of choices um, or environmental choices. And so that was really the reason why EFAZ formed. So we collectively raise awareness, um, engagement, and uh, additional financial support for all of these amazing environmental groups. In terms of raising awareness for these ecological causes, what kind of causes are we talking about here? Um, our member groups, they, they do a lot of different things. We have a lot of wildlife groups. We have four Audubon groups, if you can believe it. Um, Southwest Wildlife, Wild at Heart. Um, uh, those are really popular groups. So those are our wildlife groups. We have a lot of land trust, uh, land focus groups, mm. McDowell and Orange Conservancy, Desert Field House Land Trust. Then we have native plants, um, and you're going to be speaking about later today. Um, Desert Botanical Garden, um, the Arboretum at Flagstaff. And then we have um, some different kind of groups, like Sonoran Institute or Western Resources Advocates that focuses a lot on policy, energy, transportation. We have Arizona Recycling Coalition also, that's part of the city of Phoenix. And so when someone hears about this and they say, these are ideas that I like, these are causes that I like to support, your group makes it easy through workplace giving to fund those groups. Absolutely. Again, we're, we're, we come in into the workplace, it's either public or private. So if you go on our website, you'll see we currently partner with many cities across the state, counties, and also companies and businesses. Um, and so employees, they can give through the workplace, their workplace giving programs um, through us. They can choose one or more of our specific group groups if they really love those causes, or they can choose, if they can't decide, they can choose to give to EFAZ, and that one gift is spread out equally amongst all of our 28 uh, member groups. And you mentioned uh, uh, cities being involved, Tempe, Peoria, and Surprise, the latest additions there, mm -hmm. huh? It's very, very exciting, yes. Um, City of Tempe um, and Surprise and Peoria. We are partnering with them this year. Um, it's it's been fabulous. Um, now with City of Phoenix, it's our third year with them. Uh, this fall, we've done amazing activities with them. It's really, really been terrific. We, we have some photographs of, of a tour. And again, you guys may use uh, volunteer opportunities and wildlife rehab, and you also give tours as we see some of these uh, City of Phoenix workers. Kind of, now, what are, we, what are we seeing there? Absolutely. Um, yeah, that, that's a, a huge part of it. It's not just about giving. We, we really want to build partnerships with workplaces and give them a chance to just first learn about our groups, learn about this incredible work being done, and, and get to know them through these tours and volunteer opportunities. Um, City of Phoenix, their um, community service fund drive um, committee members, they came out to Southwest Wildlife Conservation Center. We did a fabulous tour um, with them. Actually, the response was so great that City of Phoenix, they had to schedule back-to-back -to -back tours. It was still so great that we had to do a third tour at Wild at Heart, um, or two tours up there, I think the following weekend. So when given the, the options, um, some great things can happen. So that was really fun. Well, and that the owl is fantastic. That's, yeah. uh, this cat's fantastic, the, the, the bald eagle. I mean, you, you send people out there, they see what they're, what they're, where their money's going or where their money could go. Yeah, absolutely. It makes a big difference, doesn't it? It does. It does make a big difference. When you're actually there and you're seeing where your dollar is going, it, it really makes all the difference. And again, not just for giving, but for learning and for volunteer opportunities as well so that that's really what we're about it's the giving piece is just one part of it we really are a statewide hub resource for green for education for getting involved volunteering again um, and jobs also even? jobs even on our site there's on, under the get involved tab there is a, um, a jobs page with some great sustainability resources job green job sites um, other kind of resources locally and nationally. And uh, over the years now, how much do you think you've raised so far? Right now we're over a million. So um, it's pretty good. On, on average, every year it's about 125,000 that we raise for all of our member organizations. And is that number growing even despite the tough economic times? Or how's, what's, it, the, what's the graph looking like? It is, it is. No, that's a good question. Um, it, the last couple of years, so last say four years, it's been a little bit up and down. 08 was our best 
last year, and that was about 150,000. And then after that, with the economy, it went down a bit. But um, but it's growing. And then again, with with new partners, with Tempe and Surprise and Peoria, and great engagement with City of Phoenix, um, we're looking at this year having some greater greater support. Well, congratulations on your success, continued good fortune. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you so much. That's it for this Focus on Sustainability on Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. SRP's new Community Solar Program is proud to sponsor Arizona Horizon. This SRP program offers customers an alternative way to take advantage of solar energy without adding panels to their roof. More at srpcommunitysolar.com.